Welcome, everybody. Glad you're tuning in to this last installment of this video series that I've done, answering two big questions. One is what happened to Fred, and then the second one is how is Fred doing? And so last video, I talked a little bit about recovery, and in this video, I want to talk a little bit about therapy because those are really the two key things that have gone into how I'm doing and getting into a healthier and better place. So if you missed any of those first videos, I did four of them on what happened, did insomnia, Xanax, alcohol, and then a third one on ministry burnout, and then a fourth one on marriage, and then this little thing on how am I doing, first on recovery, now on therapy. And so I realized that in our world today, counseling and therapy has become far more acceptable and people I think value it in our world today. It's kind of interesting. My parents grew up in a world where very few people went to therapists, went to counseling, went to psychiatrists, went to any kind of support groups or anything like that. In fact, it was almost like Oh, only people, pe only the people that are really bad off do that. And it was almost like a pride thing. It's like, yeah, our marriage isn't bad enough. We don't need counseling. We don't need this. We don't need therapy. I don't need therapy. You know, it was kind of a pride issue. But I think, I think in a positive way, our world has changed a lot. I mean, I know now one of the biggest growing industries in America over the last couple of decades have been, you know, coaching and mentoring and personal trainers and therapists. And I mean, you can just go on and on and on the kind of help and support that you can get out there. And so I, I think it's been a good thing. And I think therapy could be really helpful. As I mentioned last video, recovery coupled up with therapy is a way that you can increase your recovery percentages. But I, I found that counseling and recovery is important probably periodically throughout your life. And I know I've accessed counseling prior to um, this whole meltdown I had. So I, I had a personal counselor that I went to on, on a fairly regular basis. Um, and then now that I've been in recovery, I wanted to find a couple of therapists, and I did. I, and so I've been going to therapy now for over a year, way over a year, uh, since my meltdown. And I found two different therapists that I wanted to work with that work with two different kinds of models of therapy. And so I'll explain these two models of therapy to you briefly and then I'll tell you why I felt like I needed these okay so the first kind of therapy that I wanted to connect with was one that some people would call family systems there's a guy named Schwartz that developed uh, family systems back in the 90s there's another gal that that uh, built on his work Diane Fosha Dr. Fosha and she developed that type of therapy in a, in, a, in a little bit different, but fuller direction. And then there's a gal that recently I've really come to like that has popularized Fosha's work. And it's called the Change Triangle. And the gal's name is Hillary Jacob Hendel. And she has a lot of resources available for this particular therapy model. Uh, she calls it the Change Triangle. And... Um, she wrote a book that I highly recommend titled, It's Not Always Depression. And the basic concept here in the ch change triangle, if you think about a triangle, um, uh, at the at underlying the, the change triangle, you have what she would call your core emotions. And by the way, getting at core emotions and connecting to your emotions is a huge part of therapy. And it, the, honestly, this was a big issue for me because I had grown up in the church world and 
when I thought about my two natures, some of you who grew up in a church world, you know, talk about the battle, like Galatians 5, between your old nature and your new nature. I always associated my negative emotions, like anger and sadness and fear and those kinds of things, disgust, with just like the things that I needed to die to. So unfortunately for me, many times an emotion like anger, I just try to kill it or suppress it instead of actually trying to figure out what it was trying to say to me. And so, so that's a little bit different angle. And I actually writing a, a blog called True Self, False Self, you might want to read that goes into a little bit more of the theology of this and, and why it's personally important for me to do this kind of therapy. But different people get it, core emotions different ways. There's a thing called the feeling wheel, and it has, you know, like six core emotions that they feel like all of the several hundreds and hundreds of feelings are based on. But uh, Hindle talks about how core emotions register in our bodies physically. And these physical responses in our body, we can match them up with emotions. And so she would say we have seven core emotions and it would be sadness, fear, anger, joy, excitement, sexual excitement, and disgust. So these would be kind of foundational. These would be our, our core emotions. Those are important to listen to. They're hardwired into our brain. If we study the brain, that they're, they're actually centered in a part of the brain. They affect us physically. We can feel these emotions in our body. What happens with a lot of people, like say anger, they don't deal with it wisely. They don't listen to it. They suppress it, shut it down. And this can lead to like behaviors and defensive things like depression. If you shut down anger in an inappropriate or unhealthy way, it'll manifest itself in all kinds of depression and other things. So anyway, um, she also says that we have what we would call inhibitory emotions. So we have core emotions, which are important to listen to, understand, feel them in our body, and you know have a process of dealing with those in a healthy way. But then we have inhibitory emotions, which that's when we just want to shut down a core emotion. And for me, I was always trying to shut down my negative emotions, like fear or anger or sadness and grief, but particularly fear and anger, I try to shut those down. And so with inhibitory emotions are like guilt, shame, and anxiety. And as I got into therapy, I realized that, man, so much of my emotional world was sent in those inhibitory emotions. I have a lifetime of shame, a lifetime of guilt, and a lifetime of anxiety that I have dealt with and sometimes not in healthy ways. And so I had to get in touch with those inhibitory emotions. And then, and then we have defenses. And so on the triangle, you know, you have this, uh, you have your core emotions, your inhibitory emotion, and then you have your defense uh, behaviors. And your defense behaviors would be something like, um, uh, any kind of behavior that tries to shut down or even avoid an inhibitory emotion or a core emotion. So you shut down your, your inhibitory emotions, let's say shame or guilt or anxiety or a core emotion like fear and anger through a defensive behavior. And so those can be addictions. Uh, those can be any kind of behavior that we're doing just to try to avoid those emotions. So anyway, she recommends a whole process for learning how to deal with your emotions, a whole way of checking in to your body and how they register. It's, and it's a great, great healing model, at least for me, because I had to get in touch with core emotions and inventory emotions and then how I was trying to shut those down through different kinds of behaviors, all right? So that was one model that was really helpful for me. The other model that I really, really found helpful was called DBT. And that's uh, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. And this was developed by a lady named Marcia Leinheim. And she is, she's still alive today. And this has been an amazing 
therapy model that's been used in rehabs and recoveries all around the world, but it's great for all kinds of uh, personality disorders. It's called DBT, and it basically has two key areas. One's called acceptance skills, and the other is called change skills. So there's a certain part of our life that we have to learn how to accept, and these skills, these acceptance skills, are like mindfulness and distress tolerance. And then there's another set of things where we need to change. So we need to kind of accept like our past we can't change. The only thing we can live is the present and our future. But so many times we dwell on the past and we don't accept the things and we live with regrets and shame and guilt and all these kind of things about our, our past. So I really had to, in this meltdown of my life and how, how shameful that was, how embarrassing that was for me, I had to really come to that place where I radically accepted what had happened in my life. This is my story now. I got to own it and and move forward from it. But but then I there's also things that I need to change, and so they're changing. She says the change skills in, in this DBT therapy are emotion regulation and interpersonal effectiveness skills, and so it's just a it's a really interesting model built on this idea of acceptance and change. It also talks about how we arrive at, at different places that are in tension with each other. And a lot of times the, there's a healthy place where we hold uh, two, two things in healthy tension versus trying to eliminate one or the other. And so acceptance and change would be a great example of that. But the whole model is built around some of these dialectical tensions that we experience in our own emotions, our own thinking, and our own life, and our own behaviors and skill sets. So I found it really helpful as well. So uh, just, just so you know, those would be two models that I found really helpful that particularly addressed some of the issues that I was dealing with, but particularly this issue of core emotions and understanding how those core emotions were connected to my shame, my guilt, and my anxiety. As I look back over my whole life, I realize that shame has been a big part of my life in key areas. I've had, I've had deep shame in multiple areas of my life that I've had to work through in therapy. I've always had guilt feelings. You know, like you think about some of the pastoral issues that I dealt with and I talked about trying to meet people's needs and how you can't make people happy when I talked about ministry burnout. Well, that was a nonstop process dealing with conflict, dealing with the people's expectations, dealing with people being disappointed in me or this or that or the other. And that all created a sense of guilt, sometimes a sense of shame. And then also I had a lot of triggers when it came to anxiety. And so part of my anxiety, I think, is a part of how my brain just wrapped out and went crazy. I was running all the time, 100 miles an hour. I couldn't shut my brain down at night. So my insomnia is tied to my anxiety, which is tied to the the guilt and the shame stuff, which ultimately ties down to some of the negative emotions that I had like just tried to defeat, battle, suppress, be victorious over, all within that model or that framework of like trying to die to my old self. So if I had a negative feeling, instead of listening to it, I'd try to die to it. And in, in, in effect, I would suppress an emotion that I actually really needed to hear, listen to, figure out what it was saying to me and let that lead me into some type of a healthy response, even to a negative emotion. So a lot to learn, a lot to grow. It's amazing how you can live your whole life um, dealing with your, your walk with, with God, your, your spirituality, um, studying scripture, teaching this to other people. And yet your own world can unwind and melt down. And that's certainly what happened to me. And so in a lot of ways, I just felt like I was like, hey, man, I'm just going to go back to the drawing board. I'm going to do some healthy things and get connected with some healthy people and just really try to learn and grow all over again. I can say this, that um, as I slowly emerged out of the darkness, and by the way, that's been an ongoing struggle for me, really. Uh, ongoing struggle, like these emotions of shame and guilt and anxiety have been oh so present with me. And it just feels like it stuck me 
you know, like I'm in a hole I can't climb out of, that kind of a thing. So as I've slowly, over this last year, month, several months, began to move out of that darkness, uh, I found my spiritual hunger come back. I found that I, I want to read and grow again. And so in a certain sense, I've tried to embrace that childlike spirit that Jesus talked about, where he says, you know, you can't enter the kingdom if you don't become like a child. And, and I think there's certain things about childlikeness that we have to embrace. And certainly one of those is learning, growing, and having a hunger, a spiritual hunger that leads us to healthy places. So again, thank you for praying for me. I know that's kind of a general uh, overview of therapy and at least the two therapy models that have helped me the most. And and if, if, if that kind of clicks off something in you, that's great. I could help resource you if you want to reach out to me on social media or whatever. But thanks again for tuning in. Thanks for praying. Where I'll be going from here is I'll be starting a new podcast series. And I'll be covering lots of spirituality topics on this podcast. It's going to be called Spirituality Adventures. And so uh, stay tuned and it'll be lots of fun content, lots of fun interviews coming out on that. But this kind of concludes the uh, how is Fred doing, what happened to Fred component of my story. So thanks for tuning in and God bless you.